We are so glad you are here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, and I want you to, you're going to want to go and tell all of your friends what they missed, and, but we're going to have it on video for you, so you'll be able to share as well. We are so glad to have each one of you. This is going to be such an incredible evening to, to hear our speaker, Mark Lardis, and to learn about the Port of Houston with things that you, you really probably many of you don't know much about and I know he has some new things that we don't know anything about so I'm really anxious to hear about the court and how it grew into being the economic number one generator that we have in our region and largely in our state today so we're very excited about that um, I want to tell you a little bit about Mark he holds a degree in naval architecture and marine engineering but his career, most of his early career, was spent as a, as a space engineer at the Johnson Space Center. And he was with the Johnson Space Center doing space shuttle structural analysis and space navigation until the end of it. And he hung in there till the very end. And finally, at the end of it, he fortunately, he says, got laid off at the very last minute because then he was able to get the package that goes along with that and then he became <laughs> so he was grateful for that and then he, he now works with national all well varco as a technical writer and he said this is just as exciting and challenging as working with the johnson space center so he's still got another great career and in his spare time he finds time to write books and he has written 20 incredible books. And, but I am so excited about this one because to learn about and to have in one book the history of the Port of Houston and how it has grown and impacted our lives every single day is an incredible experience for us. Mark is also the president of the Houston Maritime Museum Ship Models Association. So he, they meet here and he can tell you about that as well. He is an avid historian and a longtime ship modeler and that's what has, I guess, made him interested in writing about navigation and about the port. So we are so excited to hear from him today. Um, and, and I have to share one more thing with you. I had the a distinct privilege of writing the forward for this book and that was the first time I'd ever done that. I was so surprised when he asked me and it meant so much to me because he asked me so that I could share about our museum and our new museum of coming at the Port of Houston. So we're very blessed to be able to promote our new museum project in Mark's incredible book. And there are books for sale in the back. We have the Houston, um, excuse me, the River Oaks Bookstore here with us tonight. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end, but you are going to be able to purchase books and have our wonderful author personally sign them for you. So please enjoy Mark Lourdes, and we'll have more opportunities to learn more even about all these other opportunities at the end. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is very typical. Um, this is our sign-in sheet, and we're going to pass it around, starting here with Phil. Even if you're a member of the museum, if you would please fill it out for us. We want to keep track of all the people who are here and how many people we have at each one of our lectures. And then also, if you're not on our email list, if you would add your email, we would love to be able to include you on the email so you'll find out about all the upcoming lectures and events that we have going on. Thank you so much. Okay. And the sound system works tonight. I'm not squeaking the way I was last time. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Port of Houston today, and I'm titling this at the intersection of geography and technology because that's really the story of the Port of Houston. Today, it's the second largest port in the United States as measured by cargo tons. And in 2011, that was 265 million tons of cargo. Uh, they also have about 2 million ton, or, I'm sorry, 2 million TEUs, which is the measurement of containers. Uh, and that's actually about half a container. It's like a, a 20 foot trailer. But still, that's an incredible number. It generates a million jobs in the Houston area, in Texas, and it has a $178 billion impact on the economy. Which begs the question, why Houston? Because yes, it's the second largest port in the United States, but it's also 50 miles from the sea. 
Now we've heard the story about, you know, nowadays I think people tend to believe that the port's creation and its growth was inevitable. And we've heard the, the traditional origin stories about the Allen brothers, John and Augustus, uh, setting up, planning a town at the intersection of White Oak Bayou and Buffalo Bayou, which looked kind of like that. It, it really doesn't look like much of a port. <laughs> and um, there was already a port on Buffalo Bayou called Harrisburg, about five miles down. And actually what had happened was the Allen brothers had originally tried to purchase uh, Harrisburg and set up their port there. But the problem was that the title was clouded. There were various problems with the estate of the man that had, had established it. They couldn't buy that, so they thought, okay, we'll declare the intersection of or the, the, the mouth of White Oak Bayou and Buffalo Bayou as the head of navigation for Buffalo Bayou, which was, well, pretty much nonsense because it took like three days for the first steamship to get from Harrisburg to Houston. So something is going on. Why did it work? Again, I'll go back to the title of mine. It was uh, my talk, which is, it was due to technology and it was due to geography intersecting at White Oak Bayou and Buffalo Bayou. First off, let's talk about the technology. In 1836, when Houston was established, the basic modes of transportation, the cutting edge technology by sea was the steamboat. And the steamboat made both the port of Galveston possible and it made river transportation possible and practical because in a narrow channel it's very difficult to get a sailing ship up because you have to wait for the wind to blow in just the right direction. Steamboat, steamboat doesn't care. It can go upstream in a narrow channel kind of like Buffalo Bayou. Um, the steamboat also made Galveston practical as a port. Galveston is unique in um, the Texas Gulf Coast in that it was the only 19th century port that was on the sheltered side of Barrier Island. Every other port was either an open roadstead or it was on the, or you, you docked on the outside of the Barrier Island and that made those ports extremely vulnerable to storms. Galveston, on the other hand, you needed a massive storm to threaten the ships that were in Galveston Harbor. But the problem with Galveston Harbor is a fair wind to get into Galveston Harbor was a dead stopper to get out and vice versa. However, with steam tugs, you can tow the steamboats in and out of Galveston. So without steamboats, you really wouldn't have had Galveston Harbor, or you would have, but it would have been much more limited. Okay. That's why Galveston's important, but what makes Houston important? And the, the answer to that is the other end of the technology equation, land technology, which is draft animal drawn wagons. Horse carts, ox carts, mule drawn carts. That is how the farmer got his crop to market in Texas in 1836. So, what you wanted to do, if you didn't want to quite literally eat your profits, because remember, you gotta feed those draft animals as they're pulling whatever produce you've got in that wagon, is you want to get it to some place where you can load it aboard a steamboat so that you can sell it and it can go to a seaport and then get shipped somewhere else where they want it. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking cattle, whether we're talking cotton, wheat, whatever. In Texas, the main cash crop at that time really was cotton and would remain so for over a hundred years. So, where, if, if we're talking about the, the Texas plains where the initial uh, plantations were set up, you're talking about what's now Brazos County and north and, east and west of that. Well, 
gee whiz, we can't go down the Brazos River because if you go down the Brazos River, you get to Lavaca, which is, well, an open roadstead. You want to get your crop to Galveston, and that means that you need to go on Buffalo Bayou. Yes, you can take, um, you know, San Jacinto River or Trinity River, but those really go up into East Texas, and that's not really cotton growing country. The cotton growing country is west and north of Houston. And that means that Buffalo Bayou is the closest waterway. And guess what? Houston is five miles closer than Harrisburg. That's a day's journey. And if you're a farmer, rancher, plantation, doesn't matter, that's money. So you're gonna stop in Houston rather than push on to um, push on to Harrisburg. So that's the reason that Harrisburg ends up losing out to Houston because Houston just happened to be closer to where the cargoes were being created. So again, the Allen Brothers gamble paid off because they were in the right place given the technology of the day. And for the next 40 years, really from about uh, 1836 through a minimum of 1860 and really after that to about 1870, Galveston and Houston had a symbiotic relationship. Andy Hall talks about this in his excellent book, The Galveston-Houston Packet, where cargoes for inland Texas would go up by steamboat to Houston, be unloaded at Houston, and then agricultural goods would be loaded at Houston and then transshipped to Galveston and from there they'd be put on ocean going ships. So Galveston grew, Houston grew, everyone was happy. Except a new technology had come along. The iron horse, the railroad. And the railroad provided some very interesting both opportunities and challenges to the city of Houston. The first thing is Five miles is nothing to a railroad, okay? Even the 50 miles from Houston to Galveston really isn't that big a deal to a railroad. Um, and in fact, when the first railroads got put in, linking Houston and Galveston, the first thing that went away was the passenger traffic and all of the car all of the shipping between Galveston and Houston thereafter was purely cargo. Kind of like what would happen to the railroads when the aircraft came along. You know, passenger rail disappeared. Same thing happened between Galveston and Houston. Passenger uh, packet travel disappeared. More than that, um, you know, the, the thing is that what Galveston was trying to do at that point is completely cut out Houston. You know, after all, you know, they, they can charge more, they can get a bigger profit margin by having the cargoes come directly to Galveston. So by the, after the Civil War was over, Houston began its, re, its reach to the sea. And you can see a paper arguing that Houston should have a deep water channel. Uh, part of what Houston did to ameliorate the threat that Galveston offered was set up barge to ship services and that started in 1869 and you would take cotton barges typically but you also had other cargoes that would be loaded into a barge in Houston and then they would be taken out to Bolivar Roads which is the gap between uh, the Bolivar Peninsula and Galveston Island and loaded onto deep draft ships. At the time, um, Galveston itself had a fairly shallow draft port between 14 and 16 feet. And a lot of ships at that time already had a 25 foot draft. So it, they couldn't come into the port of Galveston. However, they could anchor in the roads which were sheltered by the Boulevard Peninsula and the barges would go there and they'd load the, the uh, cargoes onto the ships there. Um, another thing that Houston did, and this will come up as the story goes on, they used some of their influence in Congress because Houston already was a bigger city 
than Galveston by that point, because another advantage of the railroad was Houston was a much better railroad terminal than Galveston because you know you could approach Houston from a number of different directions and there's only one way you can get to Galveston. So Houston was developing into a real rail hub and they got Houston made a port of entry in 1870 and also in 1870 they got authorization to build a six foot deep 100 foot wide channel from you know Bolivar Roads to the um, uh, to uh, Main Street on Buffalo Bayou and the idea was we were going to build a major seaport at the foot of Main Street. Unfortunately that work was killed by the panic of, of 1873. The company that had been chartered to build it went bust and it went absolutely nowhere. So then in 1873, well, gee whiz, that panic of 1873 had some other consequences. One was Charles Morgan owned the Morgan Lines. It would later become the Southern Shipping Lines, and it was the largest steamship company that operated in the Gulf of Mexico. He was also a railroad magnate. He had a big interest in the railroads, particularly the ones that fed into New Orleans. And but prior to 1873, after the Civil War, prior to 1873, he had free wharfage privileges at Galveston. That meant he could bring his ships up and they didn't charge him anything. <coughs> then they decided to charge him. And of course he did what any entrepreneur of that day did, he found somewhere else to go, and that somewhere else was Houston, which was a lot hungrier. Uh, so he contracted for a nine foot deep channel, which was deep enough for the ship on the right, which is the steamship Morgan, to get into Houston, and he dredged out a channel that was nine feet deep along Buffalo Bayou. More than that, he bought Morgan's Point, which was a spit of land that went out and caused a big detour uh, to get to the mouth of the Brazos River, and he cut a canal through there. Okay, and you can see that picture is actually a picture of them digging that canal, and it's got to be that because that was the only part of the Houston Ship Channel that went through what had been ground, okay? Everything else was dredged. <clears throat> What's interesting is because he went through land that he owned, that meant that canal, and it was unique in the United States, was private property. He dug it, it was his land, you want to use it, you have to pay a fee. And he even put up a chain across it to make sure <laughs> that you couldn't use it without paying the fee. Now, you know, that really hacked a lot of people off. <laughs> um, you know, but again, it was, it's like I said, I think it was the only case in the United States where you had a waterway going across privately owned property. So he was within his rights, however much people in Houston disliked it. What was interesting is that this was intended as a temporary thing. What Morgan really wanted to do was use this, use Houston as a port until he finished the railroad from, Saint, uh, from New Orleans to Houston and then he was just going to load all the cotton onto railroads in Houston, ship them to New Orleans and, and send them to sea that way. A couple of things happened. One was that, well, Mr. Morgan died, and his heirs really weren't interested in pursuing that dream. And besides, his system, and essentially they bought the canal, the, the government bought the canal, cut the chain, and now we have a nine foot deep channel going to Houston. But the problem was this was by 1890. And by 1890, that wasn't good enough. Main reason, Galveston was kind of unhappy with the fact that Houston was a rival, 
So what they did was they deepened their port. They dredged it out in the 1880s and 1890s, and by 1895, you could dock 25-foot deep draft ships in Galveston Harbor. So that was a real threat to the port of Houston because that threatened to wipe out that wharfage trade. The other problem was the foot of Main Street was really too narrow, too crowded, and too shallow for to really operate as a port. And that's actually a postcard that's done in 1911 and it shows the Main Street Viaduct and that cut off what had been half of the port of Houston up to that time. You could get under it, it was pretty much with barges. So the city of Houston regrouped and came up with a new plan. They were going to turn Houston into a deep water seaport. And of course we do this in the traditional Texas way with, you know, we roll up our sleeves and we get our congressman to give us a hand. <laughs> <laughs> and legislation was sponsored by Thomas Ball, who was the house rep for the city of Houston, um, to get a 25 foot deep, 100 foot wide channel from Boulevard Roads to the foot of Main Street. That was the initial thing. And also create a, <coughs> create essentially a harbor that was 25 feet deep and 500 foot wide at Constitution Bend, which was a wide spot in, in Buffalo Bayou. It was named because the steamship Constitution proved to be too big to turn around at the foot of Main Street, and it had to back up until it reached Constitution Bend. That is the current location of what we now call the Turning Basin Terminal. They were also going to straighten Buffalo Bayou, and uh, among the people that helped do that plan was a certain Roberts, um, Charles Roberts, who, who's best known for Roberts Rules of Orders. Mm -hmm. So he, his picture is in my book, it's also up on the wall over there. He was with the Army Corps of Engineers. He thought that uh, Galveston was a better harbor, but he did agree that it made sense, you know, that a channel to Houston could have paid off. The problem was that Congress was, well, a lot more tight-fisted back then than they are today. and. They sort of got it authorized, but they couldn't get Congress to agree to pay for it. So the city of Houston did something that had never been done up until then, but would become very common later on. They said, we'll tell you what, if you pay for half of it, we will pay for half of it. And they raised bonds, and there's one of them right there, to fund the deepening of the channel. Congress bought off on that. And then the plan was, starting in 1900, to go ahead and dig, dig the ditch. Meanwhile, there's stuff going on in the rest of the world. And again, technology and geography starts uh, coming into play. First thing is, about the time they decided to build the ship channel, they decided to build this big ditch through the Straits of Panama, Panama Canal. Um, gee whiz, guess what that does to Gulf Coast shipping? It makes it a lot more attractive because you can now get cargoes to the Pacific from the Gulf Coast. And basically, you know, despite what you might think, there really wasn't much of, an in, uh, of a transcontinental railroad system. It was very difficult to get cargoes from one side of the country to the other. It was fairly easy to get cargoes from you know the east coast to Houston but getting them all the way over across the Rocky Mountains wasn't really that economical so Panama Canal suddenly makes both Galveston and Houston much more attractive as ports as far as agriculture goes and, and other commodities uh, Texas became a very important cotton growing Area. And you can see just those railroad cards stacked with cotton. And then something else was coming along, this, this whole thing called, you know, rock oil, petroleum. Uh, you have the big spindle top hit in 1900, 19, I'm sorry, 1901. And pretty soon, 
Texas isn't just known for its cotton and its cattle, it's known for petroleum too. And that will play a role later on. And then on top of that, uh, Galveston got an unwelcome visitor in 1900 in the form of a hurricane that flattened the town. This also made Houston look a lot more attractive as a seaport because Houston was, well, 50 miles inland. Had a lot of buffer space to take up the effects of the hurricane. <coughs> so, over the next 10 years, they built the sea channel, the, the ship channel. You can see uh, upper, upper left, you can see the turning basin in 1910 with one of the dredges that was used to deepen the port. The ship below there was the Wash, I, I think it's the Washington, which was another dredge that was built to deepen this, the ship channel. It was, a, it was one of the largest ones. And, you know, so now we've got the technology to, to dig a channel. And the nice thing about Houston ship channel, it's all mud. You don't have to blast anything. All you have to do is move dirt. And you can move dirt all the way down to bedrock, which is at least 500 feet down in this area. So, I mean, you want a 500 foot, a port with a 500 foot draft for the ship channel? We can do that. Um, a couple of other things worth mentioning is they also had a new customs building, really in, uh, made Houston an honest-to-God international port. That's the customs house that was built in 1910. And below you see the ceremonies opening the ship channel in 1914, which coincidentally was the same year that the Panama Canal opened. Hmm. So this is the opening day, Port of Houston, and that's the Satila, which was a southern steamship line Remember Mr. Morgan? That's the company he started. And that will end up being an important, uh, an important shipping line for Houston for the next 30 or so years. Panama Canal opened the same year. And the rest, as we say, is history. Well, not really. Because in 1914, we had a harbor, but we really didn't have a seaport. And you can see on the left the promoter's vision of what the seaport of Houston looked like. And you can see all of those buildings up and down Buffalo Bayou around the Turning Basin. But in early 1920, all we had were a bunch of cotton sheds on one side of the ship channel. And that was it. So we needed to add some stuff. So, what you see in the 1920s, okay, in 1920, I believe 157 ships arrived at the Port of Houston. By the end of the decade, it was 1,000 ships a year arriving. Some things happened. First off, they hired Benjamin Allen as the first director of the port. He would remain there until 1930. And he created the port pretty much as it started and you know existed in the first 30 or so years of its existence as a seaport as opposed to a deep water port. Another thing that happened in 1921 is the Houston Pilot Association was organized. Think about the difficulty of taking a 25 foot draft uh, 25 foot draft ship up a hundred foot wide channel 50 miles. You better know where all the rocks are. You better know where all the shallow spots and all the bends and all that. Well, you cannot expect the captain of every ship that comes in there to know that stuff. So that's where the pilots come in. And the Pilot Association ends up being the, the folks that are certified to navigate ships on the Houston Ship Channel. No one else that lacks that certificate can bring the ships in. So they're going to play an important role in the port for the rest of its history. I probably won't mention them again in this talk, but believe me, they're there. The port also lacked some other things that you would think important in a port like 
Well, in 1924, one of the ships loading cotton caught fire. And they discovered that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to put out a fire, even in a dock ship, with just fire trucks. So the following year, they got a fire boat, and it was the first fire boat, and it was the Port Houston. That would be used uh, for 25 years. It was finally retired in 1951. Another important thing that happened in the 1920s, they opened up the public elevator, grain elevator number one, and that turned Houston into an important grain port as well as a cotton port. Another thing that's going on that's sort of off the scope of the port of Houston but takes place in the ship channel is the petroleum industry is building up. Now, what do you need for a refinery? You need a couple of things. Well, you need oil. Texas had plenty of that. Um, you also need a way to get that oil somewhere else. And although initially the uh, rail car was the preferred method, that really didn't work out too well. By 1920, the tanker was seen as the way to ship oil. Pipelines would come along later, but at least in the 1920s, you needed to ship your product using a tanker, and that meant you needed access to a port. And oh, by the way, a refinery is really expensive to build, so you don't want something like a Galveston hurricane wiping it out. So the advantage that Buffalo Bayou had was, well, it was 25 to 50 miles inland, and the land was higher. And that meant you could put your refinery in a relatively high spot and then build the pipes down to Buffalo Bayou, build yourself a terminal, and have the tankers go in and out from there. So that's why you see Houston becoming such an important center for the petroleum industry. Again, technology and geography intersect in such a way to smile in the port of Houston. Okay, everything's going great guns, and then in 1929, we end up with a depression. Now, the problem with the depression is that it not only affected the United States, it affected the whole world. And a lot of what Houston was exporting was stuff like, well, cotton and grain. And all of a sudden, a lot of the countries that had been buying our grain couldn't afford it. Um, cotton travel, or the cotton shipping went down nationally. I mean, shipping just went in the toilet, I mean, gone. That uh, the, uh, the grain elevator that had been shipping, you know, like three million bushels of, of grain a year in 1930, they shut it down in 1932 because there wasn't anyone that wanted the grain. They put it in mothballs. It didn't open up again until 1936 or 37. Um, oil exports dropped. We were an oil exporting country back then, by the way. We may be again soon. The other problem was that cotton revenues dropped. Again, technology ends up cushioning Houston from the worst of the Depression. And that technology comes in the form of the long-haul truck, which really came into its own at the end of the 1920s. Now, how can a tractor trailer, you know, have such a big influence? Well, the problem was, or rather the opportunity for Houston was, that there were a lot of unemployed guys around. And, uh, you know, back then, you didn't put yourself on disability or collect un unemployment. You figured out some way to make a buck. And the way a lot of these guys decided to make a buck was they would buy a used truck and trailer, and they would operate it as a single operator truck system, undercut the competition. Where have we heard that before? I mean, you know, unfair labor practices. But the thing is, all they needed to do was cover their expenses and get just enough money for them to survive. That meant that you had to pay a lot of attention to the bottom line. 
and they were shipping cotton and such from you know inland Texas actually as far away as Oklahoma to a seaport well golly gee you know the thing is that Houston was uh, 50 miles closer than Galveston that's a hundred mile round trip from the turning basin to the Galveston wharves how much diesel fuel is that can you get any more money by taking it down to Galveston no so get you know well while the railroads might have gone down continued going down to Galveston all of these truckers were carrying their product to the turning basin so and they were undercutting the railroads because they were not uh, being controlled by the Interstate Commerce Commission at that time it was only the evil railroads so a lot of the cotton that otherwise would have gone through Galveston ends up going to Houston instead and that sort of keeps Houston afloat then came really another big hit by the end of by the end of the 1930s Houston had worked its way up to about 2,000 arrivals per year and then World War II started now a lot of people think that World War II was the greatest thing since sliced bread for American shipping well it was but not really for the port of Houston ship arrivals actually tumbled because the way of the war was being fought, all the con you, you had to convoy ships. You couldn't allow them to sail independently. And the convoys were leaving off of the Pacific coast or off of the Atlantic coast. And that left Houston just sort of on its own. That's not to say there wasn't traffic in Houston, but it was much smaller. On the other hand, Houston did end up shipping a lot of military goods, as you can see in the upper uh, left-hand corner and lower right-hand corner. Houston also remained a major port for petroleum products and that included a giant toluene factory that they built um, in what's now the Jacinto port terminal they also built a massive butane plant in the ship channel to make artificial rubber because we were running out of that so as far as the tanker traffic went that increased because of the war general cargo dropped however the other thing that happened was that Houston ended up becoming a major shipbuilding port and you had Todd shipyards you had several shipyards um, there were 66 Liberty ships built in Houston there were a large number of destroyers and destroyer escorts and two of the destroyer escorts were built in Houston on the ship channel were the Stewart, which is still in Galveston Harbor today, and the Samuel B. Roberts, which was one of the ships that fought the Japanese battleship fleet off Leyte, off Samar, in 1944. The Roberts ended up getting sunk, her captain ended up getting a Medal of Honor, um, and they saved a lot of the escort carriers they were guarding from the Japanese battle fleet. However, once World War II ended, all of a sudden Houston becomes a real focus for cargo. And from call it 46 to 1956, I call those the brawny years because those are the years when general cargo just goes through the roof in Houston. Everything is being shipped out of Houston. Cars, uh, cotton still being shipped out, manufactured goods, petroleum products. The rest of the world is just in the toilet. They've been ruined by World War II. And the United States is shipping stuff overseas, you know, like a baker makes rolls. And Houston benefited from that. You can see the Long Reach docks in 1946. Every berth is filled. Uh, cattle from Houston going to somewhere. Um, the thing on the right, that's the uh, public grain terminal number one in 1955, and it was shipping more wheat out of there, grain out of there, than it had been during the peak years of the 1920s. And in the bottom, 
you can see ships of the Likes Line at the Long Reach docks. Likes Line for a long time was the world's largest shipping company and it was headquartered in Houston. So these were good days. The thing is that at the time it took you know, platoons of longshoremen to put the cargo on the ships because they'd take them in pallets and pack them in individually. So, of course, as the 1950s ebb away, technology rears its head to affect uh, the maritime industry once again. So, where is the next big technology play going to be? And at that time, the two leading contenders, people thought nuclear power. Actually, you know, today we can sort of see some problems with nuclear power uh, merchant ships, but back in the 50s that seemed like a natural extension of things. We went from sail power to, you know, coal-powered ships that use, you know, steamships that use coal for power, to oil-fired steamships, to diesel ships. Well, hey, nuclear power, it's got to be the next big thing. And Galveston put their money on nuclear power. They built a facility to refuel nuclear merchant ships in Galveston at the Todd Shipyard there. Another thing that everyone was excited about was space. And that's the Johnson Space Center. And you can see Clear Lake up at the top there. And you can also see this road that goes ends at Clear Lake. That's the reason the Johnson Space Center is here. There's a barge dock at the end of that because they thought, well, Space Center, we're going to have these large rockets, and we all, the only way we can ship them is by barge. Well, that barge dock's been used exactly twice <laughs> in the entire history of the Johnson Space Center. The first time was in 1980 when they brought that Saturn V to Johnson Space Center. The second time was last year when they brought in that shuttle mock-up. Well, those are two bad bets, weren't they? <laughs> However, what happens next is kind of interesting. This guy named Malcolm McLean is trying to figure out ways to cut costs. He is a trucker. He's trying to figure out some way to ship his goods more economically. First thing he does is he tries putting the entire truck trailer on, on a ship the wheels take up too much space. So he thinks about it and he says, let's just get the cargo box and we'll put that on a ship and then at the other end we'll pull it off and we'll put it on a flatbed truck. That's the container. In 1956 he converted a oil tanker to carry a deck load of these things. It was called the Ideal X and it sailed from a port in New Jersey because he couldn't sail out of New York Harbor because the longshoremen wouldn't let him use this technology. And the cargo came to Houston. Why? Because Galveston, the unions wouldn't let him unload there. <laughs> Besides, Houston had some bigger cranes and they could unload them more easily. Well, that turned out to be a real good idea. I mean, that turned out to be a fantastically good idea because it cut the cost of loading and unloading cargo 97%. I mean, from like 5.30 a ton to a few cents per ton. That made things was real cheap. And it had some other advantages too. You can see this Japanese ship being loaded with cotton this is in 1963. You can see their hand carts that they're using to put those cotton bales on the ship. Compare that to those uh, container cranes. They can just pick it up and put it down there. It used to take two weeks to load or unload a ship. Sailors would spend more time in port than they did at sea. Um, at, and you know, St. Louis, um, New Orleans, at one time had 
50,000 longshoremen. They also had an industry to entertain those sailors that were spending weeks in port that were almost as large. On top of that, the longshoremen, you know, you've got stuff in pallets, particularly when you had stuff like, oh, watches or whiskey or things like that, stuff would disappear. In the containers, they were locked up. So you could bring a ship in, you could unload it in a few hours, reload it in a few hours more. It could be out of the port in a day. What's interesting about the container, so the container ends up winning big. And what's interesting about the container is, remember what I was saying about the, the assumptions they made with nuclear ships? They made some equally silly assumptions about containers at first. First thing was, since these, were thing, these things were so fast, you could turn them around so quickly, people thought initially the only thing you're going to use containers for are high-end goods. It's the airmail equivalent for ships. But the thing is, when you're cutting the cost that much, that means you, know, you can take a shirt from Indonesia, ship it to the United States for next to nothing, and still make a profit. And if you had to pay uh, essentially another you know fifteen dollars per ton for a ton of shirts that would kill the transportation cost you know kill kill your profit margin would get eaten up in transportation costs the other thing is those containers could not only be put on trucks and if you look at the top picture you can see a whole line of trucks that they're unloading these containers onto but you can put them on railroads too so all of a sudden you know, literally everything changes. And since Houston was first, those transtainers that you're seeing there, you can see the, the 610 bridge in the background, those are some of the first ones put in. But by 1980, uh, actually, by, I'm sorry, 1970, Houston decided to put in the Barber's Cut container facility, which was one of the nation's first container facilities that was designed from the gr ground up as a container facility and that worked so well they, they eventually put in the Bayport container facility which can ship even more cargo and of course you know so that guy in the bottom right he's sort of the winner if you, every ship every cargo ship that was built before uh, 1990 is either a museum ship or it's gone. You know, the, they, they're now building ships that are optimized to carry containers. And, you know, in, in the title of another book on it, 90% of everything now goes by sea, and most of it goes by container. The thing is that it's not just containers that Houston, port, that makes up the port of Houston. Uh, besides the turning basin, they've expanded to other facilities. The first one was the Manchester facility, which is on the outside of the uh, uh, Sydney Sherman Bridge. What's interesting about that is that was built in the 1920s, and that was kind of a big idea. We're going to put part of the port of Houston where? I mean, that was as crazy an idea as putting Houston's airport up at Intercontinental. You know, I don't know how many of you have been in Houston a long time, but when I first moved here in 1979, you know, intercontinental, people scratched their heads because it was just so far away from the city. Well, Manchester Terminal was the same way, and it's ended up being a major facility for the Port of Houston. Some other ones that were built, the Woodhouse Terminal. Uh, how many of you have been on the, uh, on the uh, Sam Houston boat tour? Remember that grain elevator that you've seen? That's at the Woodhouse. That's at the uh, Woodhouse facility. That's just past the. Uh, that's just past the the bridge, and actually behind that, my company, National Oil Well Varco, has a big facility where they've got oil rigs. Um, another one, Greens Bayou, is also, I think, is barely visible from the. Uh, uh, the boat tour. That's the bulk facility. It's not just grain, but it's you know crushed rock, <laughs> things like that. And that's actually the newest one of the newest ones. 
they also have what's called Jacinto port. Remember I was talking about that toluene factory? Well, after World War II, the government just didn't need that much explosives. And this sat around for a long time, and eventually they converted it into a shipping terminal. Now all of these today are run by the Port of Houston Authority. Um, they all, all except Manchester, started as private cargo terminals, but one of the real problems with shipping is it's very, very cyclical, and when shipping's good, you make a fortune, and when shipping's bad, you go broke real quick. So, <clears throat> basically, the Port of Houston snapped up these facilities during periods when shipping was bad, and of course, the government, quasi-government entity has more staying power. So, so what's the port like today? Well, first off, it's spread along 25 miles of the ship channel from the turning basin to the Bayport container facility, which is just north of the mouth of Clear Lake. 8,400 vessels arrive in Houston annually. You know, talk about a crowded channel. Anyone want to do the math on how many that is a day? It's about, what, 200 a day? 250? Uh, there are both private and public terminals, although the Port of Houston Authority owns most of the biggest ones. Most of the private ones, I'd say, are, are the ones owned by the petrochemical industry because, you know, you need to make sure that there's some way to get your product out. The turning basin remains important, uh, but it's less important than it was primarily because of the Sydney Sherman Bridge which limits the size of ships that can get there. But it's still important. Containers are king, and the container terminals are really the stars of the port. As for tomorrow, technology and geography remain important. Remember what I was saying about the turning basin? That's a satellite shot of the turning basin literally today, a few days ago. What's missing? There's cotton dot, cotton dot, gone. They're tearing those down, they're updating them, they're providing, uh, changing those from cotton warehouses to modern cargo facilities. The other thing is the Panama Canal. Remember that? Well, they just deepened that. It used to be that the maximum depth of a ship in the Panama Canal was 40 feet. Remember I was talking that the Port of Houston started out 25 foot deep. They've been deepening it ever since. Right now the port is, the, the ship channel has a uh, pretty much of a 40 foot depth. However, the new Panama Canal locks, they are now 1400 feet by I believe 120 feet by 60 feet deep. Wow. Okay. Does the Port of Houston want to remain the Gulf's premier uh, container facility. If it does, they need to deepen the channel and make it wider. The good news is they only have to do this to either Bayport or at most the um, Barter's Cut facility. So we don't have to go up Buffalo Bayou for that. <coughs> Over the last hundred and 170 years, you know, 100 years as a seaport, 70 years as a river port, Houston has had a lot of decision points where something has changed in, in the technology that makes the geography different. And there's a futurist named Joel Barker that came up with this theory that every time that happens, you push the reset button and everyone starts even. When the container revolution came along, traditional 19th century and early 20th century seaports disappeared. London and Liverpool used to be two of the biggest seaports in the world. They do not exist as seaports today. 
Uh, Colchester was a small fishing village. It's one of the biggest container terminals in the world today. Similarly, in the United States, um, places like Houston, which grabbed onto the, the container revolution early, one and one big. Houston is facing some more challenges. And again, they've pushed the reset button one more time and we have to put down our bets on what we want to do. So, any questions? Wow. Is, wow. Everyone, is everyone still awake? Yeah. Uh, the Bayport facility is home to another cruise container, or cruise ship mm -hmm. line. Can you talk a little bit about what happened with Bayport competing with Galveston? That's, that same that's an thing? interesting question because that's one place where Galveston did win out. Um, part of the problem with Galveston is it succeeded itself almost to death. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. It got so busy that uh, as the saying goes, it's so crowded here, nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> and that's kind of what's happened to Galveston because they got so crowded that, that a bunch of uh, the shipping lines decided to go to Bayport. Um, and they, they dropped Galveston. So now Galveston has a surplus of berths and Bayport is finally being used. I'll point out that Bayport has been looking for this for at least a dozen years. They were going to be the next big thing. I don't know how that's going to work because I'll be honest with you, if I'm someone on vacation and my choice is Bayport or Galveston, <laughs> you know, I, I think I'd tend to favor Galveston. We'll see what happens though. It could be that both of them succeed. It could be that, you know, we end up like kids in a teeter-totter with one side winning, one side losing. So, again, I don't know. My understanding was Bayport was came up, Boardwalk, Galveston was beaches, and Galveston. Um, yeah, but the thing is, Bayport is, is well north of the came up Boardwalk. Mm -hmm. So, but in your generalities, it's 50 miles versus five miles. It's five miles from Kima versus 55 miles from Galveston. Well, that was the again though, but Galveston is more of a tourist draw than Bayport. That, there are other things to do than, than the Kima boardwalk in Galveston. So. I, think, so, I think everybody just knows where Galveston is at Bayport. Most people get a question. Well, I mean, it's, it's again, and it's, it's going to depend. We'll, we'll see what happens. I'm not a prophet. I'm a, I'm a historian. And, and remember that the, 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 the Prometheus' brother, Epimetheus, was hindsight. He was the historian. He wasn't the one that prognosticated. But if you're the risk taker, invest right. in Bayport. Right. Well, actually, at this point, if you're a risk taker, probably invest in, in Galveston, because Galveston's getting hammered by Bayport right now. The question is, how long will that last? Yes, sir. that slide that had the four different ports, Bayport being one, where are the other three? On the channel. On the channel. On the slide that had the four different ports. Oh, okay, hang on a second. Uh, of the, those four, all four of those are on the ship channel north of um, on Buffalo Bayou. Um, Woodhouse is on the north side, just east of the I-10 bridge. Manchester is on the south side. Um, the bulk facility terminal is at Greens Bayou, which is on the south side a little bit further down. And Jacinto Port is roughly across from the San Jacinto Monument. I may have missed some, but those are the four biggest ones other than the turning basin and the two container facilities. So, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much, Mark. It was great. very well a, a wonderful story the way that he's he's twined it all together so we can really understand about the port and you can take a copy of his book home with you they're $21.95 
River Oaks Bookstore. We're so glad to have them here and they have them back right in the back room. And as soon as we're through this evening, and I have some very special people to introduce you to first, so please don't leave. But um, as soon as we're through, we'll have the books for sale back there and you'll also be able to get Mark to sign the book for you before you leave. So that'll be a very special copy that only a very special people will have. And that means you. So we would love to have you do that. Now let me tell you that just as all this work was going on and the port was was the whole ship channel was being built and everyone was working so hard people in the maritime ministry still love to have a good time and they had to take off and have fun so we're going to do that with the Houston Maritime Museum and we want you to join us so next Thursday one week from the day we are going to be shipwrecked on Gilligan's Island for three hours and we're going to have entertainment it's going to be just like you're there on the set of the tv show it's going to be so much fun and, and we are really hoping a three-hour cruise yeah, well, no. <laughs> and we're hoping that you're going to join us now it's you have a, uh, the invitation here on your desk we're going to have live music we're going to have food okay this is a little bit better than Gilligan's Island was because we're going to have food catered by Papa's Seafood now you can't really oh, beat yeah. that <laughs> and we're going to have live music um and 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 hula dancers and we're also, um, it's just going to be so much fun. And we, we're going to have my ties by moonlight. We're going to, everything's just going to be really a whole lot of fun. But let me tell you, we've had a little change on this event. You see your breaking news here. And part, one of the people that I'm going to introduce you to, Leslie Bowen, and I'll tell you about her in just a minute. But she and I went down to the site in LaPorte where we were, had this event scheduled. How many of you have spent Thanksgiving in Houston and been in shorts? Mostly right. Well, you have all noticed now that all of a sudden this Thanksgiving and this November decided to be cold. We had no idea about this and so we had all this plan to be outside, which is what we really have available down here because the house that's down here is not really large enough to accommodate a large crowd. So we went down there to plan it to be outside and found that even in the middle of the day it was really too cold and we didn't want to make our guests be suffer being so cold so we decided we've done a lot of cleanup around here at the Houston Maritime Museum we've done some reorganizing of our models which you may have noticed and we're very proud of that so we're going to bring all the entertainment the wonderful food and everything we're going to have it back here at the Maritime Museum but you're going to see it different because when you come number one you're going to be greeted by valet parking complimentary valet parking mm -hmm. we're going to if the parking lot's going to be tinted and we're going to have all of the Gilligan's Island uh, attire and, and and you're gonna when you walk into the tent you'll feel just like you're at Gilligan's Island but then you'll be able to come and we'll have pictures and everything with the shipwreck and all of the Gilligan's Island crew so it's gonna be really cool then you're gonna come inside and you're gonna have this wonderful food and entertainment and get to sit down at really nice round tables it'll be very elegant and very fun well as elegant as a Gilligan's Island party can be so I hope that you will all join us we're gonna have a great time and it's going to be warm Warm. We won't be deterred by the weather, but we will have just as much fun as we would have had down on the port. So we're really looking forward to that. And if you read this, you'll see that the SS Minnow, which was shipwrecked down there, actually got picked up by the by the big winds and came the blustering winds and then was set by Poseidon right outside the Houston Maritime Museum. And I challenge you to be here to see the SS Minnow. So we're looking for you forward to you coming to this. We have tickets for sale in the back. We also have raffle tickets. We're going to have a big raffle drawing that very night at the event. And you can win one of two ship models, each valued at at least $2,000. They're back there for you to look at. The first winner, the first name drawn, will get your pick of the two ship models, and the second name drawn will get the other ship model. And you can look at them both in the back, and I hope that you'll, we have tickets, five for $25, one for $25, or five for 100. It's a great deal, and you don't have to be present to win, so if you want to participate in the fun, and you can't be here on the 21st, get you some raffle tickets before you leave tonight, okay? And now I want to introduce you to some very special people. I mentioned that our last lecture, this is my last time to be the director here. I will be back at lectures and you will see me here, but I have some family that really needs me to be closer to home. And I live in North Houston, families in Tomball, so it's quite a commute. So I am going home to, to be more, to have more time with family, but 
my, uh, I'm so excited to tell you that Leslie Bowen, who's right here tonight, who has actually been working with us for about four months as our fundraiser, and is just a dear, dear friend of mine. We've had so much fun doing things. We've put this whole event together and everything that's been going on with the museum. We've really worked together for the past several months. Leslie is a wonderful, wonderful leader, and she's going to be our interim executive director for right now, and we're so excited. I'm, I'm just, just so grateful to her for taking over, because I know now that I'm leaving my baby in good hands, so I'm really <laughs> excited about it. And also, I want to introduce you to you, uh, Kristen Joswell. Kristen has taken over for Heather. All of you knew Heather before, and we still have Lucia with us, who we're so excited to have. Lucia was our Rice intern, you remember from the summer. So we have a new team, Lucia added, just came this summer with us, and uh, so anyway, we have a new team that is, but we're very together, and they are so um, already on track for just bringing things that much farther along, packing the house, and having a great time, and the first time we're all going to celebrate together really will be next Thursday, and I hope that you will be there to join us. So please plan on that. You, the reason someone asked me, which made me very happy, the reason we don't have a flyer about our next lecture is because we're going to not have a lecture in December due to the holidays. We're going to give people a break to, to have fun with your families, but we're going to be back in January and make sure that we have your email address so you can hear about the, the uh, lectures on via email. And be sure and please, when you leave, meet our wonderful new team and also don't forget to get the raffle tickets, the tickets, and your book signed, okay? Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure working and getting to know each one of you.